That truth which the choir has just expressed is the exact opposite feeling of the world in which we live, as described by Paul in the letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. I invite you to share that scripture with me today, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and to improper conduct. They were filled with all manner of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, invent- inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve those who practice them. The section which we have just read constitutes the first of a three part indictment which Paul brings against the world. As a physician, one needs to make a diagnosis of the disease before he offers a remedy. At least I hope your doctor does that. And there is a dilemma and a sickness within the human nature. The world is divided into two camps, essentially, as the New Testament sees it and as Paul reflects it here. On one camp are those who really by their lifestyle, exhibit a tremendous falling away from God, a life that is really coming apart, raw, raucous. Another kind of lifestyle equally apart from God is the lifestyle of the supposedly religious and moral person. Yet in his religiosity and morality, there is no knowledge of God and no understanding of salvation. To both kinds of people, Paul writes, the passage we have read today addresses itself to the apparent visible evident sins in the world, especially it has reference in its first setting to those who did not have the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, to those who really had no working knowledge of God, as did the people that gathered in the synagogue. And Paul is speaking, therefore, to the Greeks, to the Romans, to the barbarians, to what we call the Gentile world. But equally as well, we understand this refers to our day, For if you read these verses and apply them to the situation that we live in, we see a great deal of similarity. This passage also seems to be a rather down passage. It is a passage which appears not to leave a great deal of hope for any person. And that is really one of its intents, to so nail the lid to the coffin, so to speak, that one realizes that he has no hope. And yet... The great hope will come as Paul develops the epistle that Christ at the right time died for the ungodly and that he gave his life for sinners. The purpose, therefore, of this passage, which we have read today, is to point out to persons that they need the gospel and that there are two reasons why the gospel of Jesus Christ is needed. First of all, Paul is saying that without the gospel, people really do not know God. They may be able to pronounce the name of God, but they do not really know God. And the second thing that Paul is saying throughout this passage is that without the gospel of Jesus Christ, God really has given up 
on people. He has abandoned people. And we will see how this fleshes itself out as we look at the text today. Has God made himself known to man? Has man abandoned its knowledge or their knowledge of God? That's the first thesis that is involved in the statement today. Without the gospel, the world, mankind, men and women, boys and girls, really do not know God. Christianity begins at a different starting point than much of modern philosophy. Much of modern philosophy begins with the starting point that man is low. Man started as an animal and rose to his current ascendancy and is on a continued rise. Scriptures start with a different standpoint and say man started very high and is on his way down. Man without the gospel is indeed on his way down. Is it God's fault that men and women do not know God? Paul's obvious answer is to this, no, it cannot be God's fault. There are two things that are necessary for communication to take place. Someone must be communicating and someone must be receiving the communication. And Paul clearly says in verse 20 that God has communicated two things to all mankind regardless of whether they have the scriptures or not. God has communicated his eternal power and his deity. That is, the fact that he is not man, that there must be a power that is higher than mankind that stands behind the whole natural order, the whole created world. And these two things, Paul says, are very clearly seen and are very evident if one will only use his mind to look at them, he will find a God of power at the base of the creation. Dr. J. Edwin Orr will be with us in two weeks, and I'm really looking forward to that because he's a former teacher of mine, and he will really, he always says something that is really a heart stirring message. In his little book, Faith That Makes Sense, <clears throat> he talks about this whole thing Has God made himself known in a way that can be understood through his creation? He talks about the alternative explanation that is offered in modern thinking for the creation of the world. Modern interpretation is that given enough time and take enough chances and something's going to happen. The world is the product of the proper combination of time and chance. He says, a pilot came to me in my tent office in New Guinea and said, tell me, chaplain, why is any man compelled to hold religious faith? Could not everything have happened by chance? I asked him jokingly what he knew about chance. And he told me with a grin that he was an expert. So I took out a coin and tossed it and asked him if it were heads or tails. He replied, heads. Now tell me, I asked, what is the chance of getting heads? He suggested one out of two. When I asked him why that proportion, he replied that each coin possessed only two sides, heads and tails. Therefore, it had to be one or the other. What, said I, is the chance of getting two heads in succession? He replied, one out of four. For three heads in succession, he replied one out of eight because it was multiplied chance. That's right, I agreed. It's the probability of the first occasion multiplied by the probability of the second multiplied by that of the third. What do you know about dice, I asked him. He grinned knowingly. So I added, what is the chance of getting a six when you roll a dice? One out of six, he replied. For two sixes in succession, he suggested one out of 36. And for three sixes in succession, one out of 216. And then for four sixes in succession, he estimated quickly 1,296. Then I asked him the chance of getting 12 sixes in succession. He allowed me to supply an answer. One out of 2,176,782,336. What, said I, do you think the chance may be of getting dice to roll the same way all the time? That's fantastic, he said. Exactly, I rejoined. Yet you talk about chance to explain the origins of our complex universe. You talk about chance to explain the complexion of our complex universe. Better to say that a Boeing 747 airplane originated through an explosion in the factory, <laughs> given a proper combination of time and chance, than to say that man, who is incredibly more complex than a Boeing 747, originated by time and chance. Christians are among the few people around that are like the little boy in the emperor's new clothes. Do you remember that childhood story? For those of you that don't remember it, I'll tell it. <laughs> Fancy Taylor comes into the empire and he's going to make the emperor a new suit of clothes, his invisible magic clothes. And he gets everybody to be gullible about it and the charlatan weaves an invisible tapestry for the emperor to wear and the emperor prays out in the street thinking he's got on a marvelous new dress, which he cannot see, but he's been codgered into thinking it, and 
he walks along and everybody in the emperor is ooing and aahing because you don't want to tell the emperor they don't have any clothes on. He's got the tailor who makes him beautiful clothes. Finally, a little boy standing on the sidelines up to his mother and says, Come, the emperor is naked. <laughs> the only one to see the truth and declare it. And it's really kind of uh, incredible to look at the sophisticated intellectual world in which we live and find people coming up with theories which are basically at their roots saying everything happened by time and chance. They couch the theories in incredible language, philosophical language, mathematical language, a language which, uh, whose words and vocabulary we may not even know, but the gut of it is the theory is naked. And Paul is saying this about God, that when, when God is so treated in this way, men are walking away from the knowledge of God. And he articulates on the receiving end three ways in which men and women have given up their knowledge of God. It starts off with something called gratitude and respect. He says, men did not honor God and they did not give him thanks. Two, two words involved, honor and thanks, or respect and gratitude. And I would just simply suggest to you that these two words are the foundation of all human interrelationships. Uh, for you that are married, you quit respecting your spouse, or you quit giving thanks. You just drop those two concepts all together from your relationship, and, and, I, and, and how long is your relationship going to stick together? You drop that from a relationship with parents and children, or you just drop those two words out of any human interpersonal relationship, and things cannot exist. There must be found fundamental respect and gratitude. So men start to slide. They neither give God thanks, nor do they respect Him. That leads to a second kind of a thing, which involves a falling away from the knowledge of God. Paul goes on to articulate that people then exchange the image of God and replace it with the image of man, and then with the image of beasts. And we live in a society which doesn't happen to be, for the most part, worshipping things that are made with the hands. So when we come to the theme of idols, we think, oh, that's a, belongs, that's a trait that belongs to an antiquarian people. People are not making things out of wood and steel and bowing down and worshipping them. Yet the very term image is the foundation of the word imagination. It is the ability to conceptualize, to replace God with another concept, be it power, or success, or use, or ambition, or whatever you may choose to substitute as that word. It is starting off by, first of all, putting man in the place of God, and honoring man, and man saying, forget any authoritarian structure, forget that God has spoken, forget revelation, we'll make our own rules, play our own game, we'll do it as men would do it. Therefore you lose a sense of that which is coming from God, that eternal and absolute which is beyond the ability of man to concoct. And when that stage is reached, there's even a further stage going down from that where the image of man is even exchanged for something lower, animals, so that animalism, bestiality, can prevail in a modern culture as well as in, a, say, a more primitive culture. I was reading uh, this last week in the newspaper of the growth of funk rock in, New, in England, which is now coming to the United States, where the uh, music situation is so degenerative that, uh, that uh, young men and women appearing in in a garb and using language and expressions and, and dissonance in their music are, are such that really one looks at them and hears what they're saying and realizes that it is really coming on the animal level. It's animalistic. And this, uh, this trend, which Paul notes here in Romans, is born out within modern culture. You and I see it every day. It's the exchange of God to worship something else. And when you exchange God for something else, you get the short end of the stick. You get the worst end of the bargain every time. And what Paul is simply saying is, outside of the gospel, men really do not have a knowledge of God because they have, they have taken what knowledge they had and abused it and misused it and therefore have sunk lower, if you will. And of course, here's where the gospel is so marvelous because it now comes along in the preaching of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It comes along and gives us a chance to really know God in His fullness. It's a sheer act of grace. It's nothing we have merited. We have blown our chance, so to speak, but God in Jesus Christ has given us another opportunity. Paul says, secondly, that God has abandoned mankind outside of the gospel. He says in verse 24 and in verse 26 and in verse 28, God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them up. Three times that theme. Now, in a foundational sense, we know that Paul is writing this letter to the Romans to, to present a doctrine of salvation. Uh, the Romans does not end with chapter 1, verse 32, or we would say, 
simply of all mankind and, and ourselves, if we stood outside of receiving Jesus Christ, we'd say, there's no hope. God has given up. But the phrase, God has given up, is, is a way of saying, if you don't take what is being said here, then, then you have really slammed the door on your last opportunity because outside of the opportunity to embrace Jesus Christ, all other hope is gone. God has given up. God has abandoned men. What essentially is involved in this statement is the following. God is saying to mankind, whom he created with freedom of will, I will give you your choice. I will give you the freedom to choose as you will. And I will ratify the choice that you make. If therefore you choose to abandon me, I am left with no choice except to abandon you. See, God is not an idea. God is a person. Ideas don't need association. Ideas don't need fellowship. But persons need fellowship. And persons seek fellowship. God is a person and he seeks fellowship. So when we reject him, we're not rejecting an idea, we're rejecting a person. We abandon him. Of necessity, therefore, he cannot have fellowship or relationship with us. God gave them up. And in this statement, here in the book of Romans, Paul articulates the three ways in which, in which you can tell that God has abandoned a particular society to its own resources. The first area is in the area of sexual morality. Where Paul says, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their body among themselves. This is the first stage of being able to see that man has exchanged the image of God for the image of man. Sex becomes a form of substitute worship. Paul indeed says that because of this, they have traded the truth of God for a lie and worshipped the, cre the creature rather than the creator. The essence of sexual relationship is the desire to be adored and to adore. This then becomes a substitute for a living relationship with God. It becomes mankind's way of saying, in reference to God, forget the old rules which you have given God. We make our own rules and play our own game. Sometimes Christians are misunderstood, I think, and, and even misunderstand what their message is by singling out sexual sin as the worst kind of sin. Paul, if, if you want to carefully trace it here, is not saying sexual sin is the worst kind of sin. He's saying it's the first sign of the landslide that is to follow. And boy, the landslide really starts by the time you get down to the third God gave them up in verse 28. It's the tip-off that something is beginning to disintegrate in society. And sexual immorality is the thing which is the most attractive for most people to do. It doesn't uh, seem at the initial uh, venture to offer any pain. It seems to promise nothing but pleasure and joy. But once into it, one becomes gradually trapped into things which come later, like strife and envy and slandering and foolishness and faithlessness and heartlessness. C.S. Lewis has made a very wise comment that we have three selves, the self we should be and the two selves that compete with the self that should be. One self is the diabolical self and the other self is the animalistic self. The diabolical self is Satan who seeks to get us to fall into sins which are common to him, spiritual sins, pride and the like. The animalistic self emphasizes the sins which relate to the senses, the desire to touch, the desire to see, to hear, and the like. And C.S. Lewis goes on to say that the worst sins are always the diabolical sins, not the animalistic sins. For it is, salvation is much more in the Gospels available to a prostitute than to a self-righteous prig. Not that we want to be either. But that one carries with it that sin of spirit. Therefore, when we focus in upon something like sexual sin, we are into saying it is the worst sin, we're simply saying it is sin, it is unacceptable with God that men should make their own rules in respect to morality. As God has set up the boundaries to best protect his people. When they break that, then God gives them over to live with the seed which they have planted and take the fruit of the seed which then grows. Then Paul says, God gives men up to another form, not simply to sexual immorality, but sexual perversion enters in. So that he, in a passionate discourse on homosexuality in verses 26 through 27, notes a phenomenon that was very present in his day. Fourteen out of the first fifteen Caesars are said to have been homosexuals. He goes on to indicate that God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Now, this is a way of saying that once homosexuality becomes present within a society, there is no hope for the homosexual in that society outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one's offering the homosexual in modern society any hope. You know what modern society is saying? 
It is saying it is not a sickness. Many are saying that. It is a right. It is, uh, it is something which is an alternative lifestyle. And no longer is the act of homosexuality have any uh, restriction against it. It is, it is now to be accepted. And so the homosexual is caught in this terrible thing which is an, uh, really bad for him. He is caught in people who are justifying the kind of trap that he's in and so that no longer can he get out of the encasement of chains which he is in. Even the church, sad to say, many aspects of it today in the world, is embracing homosexuality as a legitimate style of life so that churches are ordaining persons who are lesbians or who are homosexuals to the ministry. Such is an affront to God and manifest that even in that character of a church there is no hope for the homosexual. It is only in the gospel that there is hope for the homosexual because only the gospel is saying, you weren't made to be this way. Regardless of heredity and environment and parental factors and the like, this isn't the way God meant it to be. So the Holy Spirit comes because before we can receive God's remedy, we must, we must sense the guilt which is there. He comes to remind us and to convict us of sin. But then he comes to offer us repentance and complete pardon and freedom. And I think sometimes wrongly, as a Christian church, we have wound up con- condemning homosexuals along with the act of homosexuality when if any place in the world ought to be a place in which two things are held up simultaneously, justice and mercy, it ought to be the church. On the one hand, the church takes its stand with the Scripture and says with the witness of the Holy Spirit that homosexuality as well as immorality of any kind is clearly wrong. But on the other hand, it is saying to the person who is trapped in his sexual bondage and wants to be free, there is hope for Christ came for you and Christ came to forgive you and receive you and you can be clean. You don't need to have this sexual hang-up. You don't need to have this sexual perversion. You don't need to be in sexual bondage. Christ can and will make you free. Pat Boone has a beautiful book out called Joy. If any of you struggle with the problems of homosexuality or lesbianism, this book, written really a course of letters that were interchanged between a lesbian and Pat Boone, in which this young girl comes to an awakening in her life that she needs to get out of the trap. She writes Pat, Pat Boone, and I'm just amazed at the wisdom that God gave this man in responding to her in over a six-month period of time to see a complete healing that took place in her life. It is an incredible story. What Paul is really saying is if you look at the world, they're not going to do anything about changing the pattern of homosexuality. The world increasingly will accept it. God is allowing the world to eat the fruits of the seeds that is sown. Finally, Paul says, God gave them up to a base mind and to improper conduct. The King James uses the word reprobate mind. I always wondered what a reprobate was when I was a kid. It basically means to fail the test, to have an unapproved mind, to put it in the parlance of kids, to flunk. It's a mind that flunked it with God, that doesn't think as God thinks, and it doesn't answer the questions like God would answer them. And because the mind is gone, then the conduct is gone. The scripture always begins with a starting point in the inside, and then it works itself out and expresses in action what is there. So that Paul goes on to indicate 21 different characteristics of society that is really coming unglued. Each of these, could, we could take time to make a commentary on themselves. They are each loaded with meaning. And they really describe life as we see it so much within our society. Especially I would like to zero in for a moment on that word, heartless. Heartless. It is the 20th term used in the list, the next to the last term. Heartless. The literal meaning of that word heartless in the Greek is without natural affection. When you think of natural affection, you think of a love of a father for a son or a daughter, or a mother for a son or a daughter, or vice versa. You think of family ties. Paul is saying that when God gets done abandoning society to its own devices, Finally, one of the characteristics becomes an outbreak of without natural affection. In the ancient city of Rome, which existed at the time Paul wrote, it is said by the historian Tacitus of the period in which Paul lives, that 30 to 40 children were left every night in the forum, abandoned by their parents. Seneca, the Roman philosopher of the time, says, We kill a mad dog. We slaughter a fierce ox. We plunge a knife into sickly cattle, lest they taint the herd. 
Children who are born weakly and deformed, we drown. And this manifestation of without natural affection has become very prevalent in our society today, especially in relationship to the issue of abortion, where abortion now is practically passing the birth rate in the United States without natural affection. That a, that a person should for no other reason than the reason of convenience destroy a living being and throw it away is a manifestation of without natural affection. What the gospel has come to do is to point out the need for an understanding and for an obedience to morality, but also, on the other hand, to offer a word of hope to the person who has erred. Paul kind of drives the last nail in when he notes of a society that has been abandoned by God. Verse 32, though they knew God's desire, or though they knew God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but, are practiced, but approve those who practice them. It is his way of saying that gradually society is allowed to build within itself a climate of acceptance, an acceptance toward homosexuality, toward immorality, and toward manifestations of ugliness in the human spirit of all kinds, so that the media, the arts, education, and politics, and even a godless church wind up embracing and approving those who engage in the kinds of practices that are noted here. The end result is that man is left with only two alternatives. The first alternative Paul, Paul spells out in our passage today, an alternative he spells out in the beginning. The wrath of God, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness. Those are his two summary words for all that's wrong with mankind. Ungodliness, the, the not being like God, and, on the other hand, unrighteousness, the in lack of proper relationship to fellow man. The wrath of God is revealed. I don't know what you think of when you think of the wrath of God. It's easy to think of the wrath of God as something reserved for the future age when he judges the world. Or it's easy to think of the wrath of God kind of as, a, as an x-ray gun. You go, bang, and you zap somebody with thunder and lightning. But Paul says the wrath of God here is not simply something reserved for the future. It is already happening. It's going on. It's being revealed. It's present in society today. What simply he means is this. The wrath of God is manifested when God takes away the restraints from a society and they have wanted those restraints, first of all, to be taken away. It is in effect, the wrath of God becomes God's allowing people to eat the fruit of seed they have sown. And they didn't know that the seed that they sowed had that incredible potentiality of fruit within it. Let me cite some examples. We can think of it easily on an international basis. Take the country of India, where cows in many places in India are more important than children and are fed first and are sacred objects. Where is it in the world today that there is greater famine? It's almost an apparent manifestation of the wrath of God that in saying to a society which places cows above people, the end result is people suffer. It's God's way of allowing the society to keep its bargain with itself. Or look at America, for example, when we imported slaves centuries ago, three centuries ago now. Have we ever gotten over living with the consequences of the moral wrong that was done? We talk about slavery, maybe slavery is an abstract term, but when we think of, as I read this past week, of on a slave ship over to the United States, the captain or a sailor got tired of a baby crying and told the mother to hush the child up. And when the mother couldn't get the child hushed, the sailor just simply walked over to the child, picked it up, and threw it in the ocean. And that's just kind of a, a, a sample, that's a drop of the ocean of wickedness this country sowed when it approved slavery and when it brought it into the land. And God simply said, gave us up, in effect, to say, okay, you wanted this evil, you are going to taste the fruit of that evil. It happens in an individual way. When you break, for example, the laws of agriculture, the harvest will fail. When you break the laws of architecture, the building will collapse. When you break the laws of human health, the body will suffer. But when you break spiritual laws, there also is recompense. If you seek sex and not love, God winds up ratifying your choice. If you seek self and not God, he winds up ratifying your choice. And if you seek things and not relationships, he winds up ratifying your choice. He gives you up to what you choose. The wrath of God is the effective working out of this principle. Reap what you have sown. 
So mankind is left with that alternative. But beyond this passage in the letter to Romans is the alternative that the gospel of God has come to save us from life's infection and sin and to bring us to a place of reconciliation and cleanliness and wholeness. Come down, O Christ, and help me. Reach thy hand, for I am drowning in a stormier sea than Simon on the lake of Galilee. The wine of life is spilt upon the sand. My heart is as some famine-murdered land, whence all good things have perished utterly. And well I know my soul in hell must lie if I this night before God's throne should stand. O Christ, come to save me. Does the Lord do this? Well, we know that he does. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, says, Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Imagine that first congregation at Corinth. Some had been immoral. Some had been idolaters. Some had been adulterers. Some had been homosexuals. Some had been thieves. Some had been greedy. Some had been drunkards. Such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. So the Gospel comes to point out, first of all, our hopeless state. And then when we are convinced that outside of the Gospel, we are never going to change. We're never going to have hope. We're never going to be right. We're never going to be at peace. Then and only then are we ready to embrace the Gospel. As long as we are continuing to argue with God that we don't need the Gospel, that we can make it on our own, then God winds up abandoning us to find out and to explore for ourselves. But when we are through with our own effort, and through with our own intelligence, and through with our own works, and ready to come as a penitent before the throne of God, Jesus richly forgives us, and He not only forgives, but He restores. And that which we have lost in our sin, that image of God, He plants back into our lives so that the image and nature of Christ is written upon our hearts, and we become new. If any person is in Christ, he is new. Old things have passed, the new has come. Let's pray. Our Father, today we come to you very conscious of our unworthiness. Forgive us, Lord, as we have read this passage at various times in our lives, and not put ourselves in it and looked at it and thought of people and said, oh, aren't they terrible people? Not recognizing that within our own hearts we have been on this list. At times, if we have not been full of unnatural relationships, then we have had strife or gossiped or been haughty or disobedient to parents or faithless and even ruthless. We're all on this list, Father. I think of the Apostle Paul, who, in spite of the fact that he was a religious man, Lord, you taught him that he was the chiefest of all the sinners. Because before your presence you will allow no man to boast. For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We thank you that you've made a way where we had no way. And that in the Gospel you have come near to us. And Jesus himself stands before us, says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Come unto me and I will give you rest. So you call us today. You call those of us who are really weary and heavy laden with sin and with bondage, with failure and frustration and lostness and anxiety. And you call us to yourself to come. And we heed your call today, Lord. Just as we are, we come, knowing that you receive us and accept us, if only we will come. We praise you today for the gospel and for the chance that it gives us to be new and whole. In Jesus' name, amen.